Welcome to a 10-minute lightning talk on creating open resources where I provide an example of the process that I went through. In this talk, I'm going to cover who I am and who this is intended for, why it's important to create new open resources, how it happened, that's the majority of the talk itself, and then where to upload resources once you've created them. So let's start with who. It is only 10 minutes, and so I'm going to give the very briefest introduction into who I am. I'm a tenured assistant professor at Grand Rapids Community College. My name is Lauren Wolsey. I have a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from Harvard University. And the best way to describe my learning goals and teaching style is to listen to my students. So if you're interested in learning more, I have a link to my website. I believe high quality education should be fully accessible to every student who wants to learn. I think that's true of a lot of us who are attending this particular conference. This slide has the full session description, so I have it here in case you're watching this without the context of the Open Education Conference. If you want to read more, you can pause and read through everything, but I'm going to move on. Okay, so why create new open resources? I think the most important thing that we can recognize is that faculty should be adopting open textbooks if they can easily find high quality material that has all of the extra stuff that they're used to using. So the biggest reasons why faculty don't adopt open textbooks tends not to be because they don't believe in the cause, but because it takes time to switch. There are fewer ancillary materials, especially for newer textbooks, and it can be hard for them to find high quality texts. Now, the very first thing, we can't um, adjust for other faculty. They have to decide that this is a priority for them. And the third is something that uh, with more public knowledge of OER, it will become easier. But the thing that we absolutely as individuals can do is to create new ancillary materials so that it is easier for others to adopt open textbooks. It is also so essential in this current time that we find ourselves in, especially when the United States is still battling quite heavily with its COVID-19 pandemic. Now is the time for universal access to information and knowledge. Our students are struggling financially. We're all struggling um, with mental health. And the very best thing we can do is to continue to push for equality, equity, and all of the things that we know are important. And one of the best ways to do that is to create new resources that other people can also use. Okay, so how do we build this? Like I said, this is a lightning talk, so I'm gonna go through an overview. And this overview really boils down to three main points. You have to reflect on what you're currently using, search for what is already out there so you don't reinvent the wheel, and then make sure that the most important thing you can make sure to do is to replace any copyrighted content, especially stuff that you might not even be aware is copyrighted until you're starting to go through this process. So when you think about what you're currently using, this is really a chance to fully reflect on what you've been using, why you're using it, and what you might want to change. A lot of us, especially when we don't find as much time as we'd like in our schedules, a lot of us use the same material year after year, making updates where necessary. But for example, I teach astronomy. There's not that much to update from one year to the next. And the material that I was given when I first arrived at GRCC was from my um, faculty members, my colleagues. And I used it and updated it, but a lot of what I had as the backbone of my slides came from others. And that's perfectly fine, but this is a chance to reflect on the, the method that you use to go through the material, what order you're presenting it in, what supplementary activities and projects you might have, so that you can align what you really want out of your course with the OER resources that you're going to make. Open Educational Resources truly provides us with the ultimate customization because we can make it exactly what we want it to be. So it is also important to recognize that we don't want to make resources just for the sake of it. If high quality resources already exist, it's probably useful to use those instead of starting from scratch. This is a list of a whole bunch of um, repositories of information. The one missing from this list is OER Commons because we're gonna be talking about that a little bit later. And if you are really new to the open education scene, I highly recommend you pause the video and read through this list to make sure that um, anything that you've never heard of before is now on your radar. 
And then when you are making material, the most important thing to making the resources open is making sure that you don't have material that is copyrighted. A lot of us, if we're using old slides, might have images from textbooks that we're not even currently using, but are actually copyrighted content that we don't want to be including in what is intended to be open. So a couple of great places to look for images. Flickr.com has a Creative Commons search engine. Creativecommons.org has a specific image search engine. And I've actually found that Wikimedia and Wikipedia can be extremely useful, especially if I have a very detailed topic that I want a diagram or illustration for. Everything that's included in Wikipedia, all of the images that show up in articles, they are, by definition, openly licensed. It's always good to double check where they come from, but that is part of the process of including them in the Wikimedia universe. It's also important to recognize that written content can be copyrighted too. If you have interactive questions that you include in slides or in your course material, you need to make sure you recognize whether they're general enough questions that no one would really be able to copyright them, or if they're specific wording that you might need to create your own content and use your content expertise to fill in gaps. There are also a lot of existing test banks that can help you if you're including questions in slides. All right, so where should you put this new open resource uh, material? So I host all of my videos on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel through um, my institution, and I've created playlists for each of my two-week modules. Videos and slides are the core open resources that I have created so far in my course. And YouTube is a place where I can then have it be very easily accessible and searchable in a wide way, even for people who aren't necessarily instructors looking for open content. In terms of my slides, I have them hosted in Google Slides. Uh, so I created the Google Slides, and so I created a shared Google Drive folder that contains all of the original Google Slides files, as well as PDFs in several different layouts, and a description of what videos go with which slides. So I wanted to show what is actually in the folder that I have a screenshot of on the slides themselves. So my slide presentations, um, each two week module has its own slide set. And I follow the open textbook, OpenStax Astronomy. Now the second slide in each of these different modules is this overview slide that indicates that it is openly licensed and that there are um, recorded videos. And it's worth noting that I um, include links to the OpenStax chapter themselves so that students can easily go back and forth, even if um, someone is using these slides while not using the OpenStax textbook. This is still free and open content that students now have access to. It's worth making sure we understand that these are places where we can host the actual files, but we still need them to be um, discoverable. And so we want to make sure that we have something in at least a few um, repositories for open educational resources. If you're only going to put your material in one spot, oercommons.org is the place to put it. OER Commons is a digital library, and there are hubs for each different discipline. If you are um, building content associated with an OpenStax test textbook, then um, you can connect it with that hub as well. And so I uploaded separate course items for my set of videos and my set of lecture slides that describes what they are. It tells people how to find them. Um, and the intention is to make this easy for others to find and be able to then adopt. So as an asynchronous talk, there's no Q&A period, which is a bummer because I like to answer questions. And so you can find me either through Twitter. Uh, my handle there is prof underscore Woolsey. Or you can email me at laurenwolsey at grcc.edu. This QR code, um, if you pause the video, you should be able to scan it, and it is going to bring you to this exact set of slides, very Inception style. Um, and so then you have access to the slides themselves and all of the links that showed up within the slides. There are also some extra bonus content um, that I just couldn't fit into a 10-minute talk. Thank you for listening, and I hope that this was a helpful starting point.